Good morning and uh, good morning to everybody. Thank you for attending this uh, webinar. It's always great to, uh, to gather the community of scientists, medical doctors, public health officers on this uh, obviously most important topic. And uh, thank you so much to Scott Weaver for being with us. In a minute, I will hand over to Shin Hee Kim, uh, the scientific director of GVN to introduce uh, Scott, but I, I just want to make a very few points of introduction regarding some ongoing activities of the GVN. So I'm Christian Brechot, the president of the Global Virus Network. I know that most of the attendees are members of GVN, so they know everything, but some are not. So just to remind you that uh, this is a network uh, which really gathers the best experts in, uh, in virology worldwide. This is really working as an uh, informal community which really only aims to join forces, merge expertise, and really design the best activities to counteract uh, epidemics, uh, pandemics, obviously, such as COVID-19, but many others. GVN is indeed working on all human viruses, Obviously, again, we are focusing on COVID-19, but uh, we are dealing with all viruses. And if you have ideas or suggestions, you are always welcome. Uh, our activities combine research, task force, such as on COVID-19 and others, uh, education, training, and also advocacy, and a lot of partnerships with industry. And uh, in this uh, context, we have recently created with uh, Linman Nee, vice president, the, uh, the corporate centers, I mean, where we really recognize the value of uh, working with our partners, uh, not only to get financial support, but really to work with them to design the strategy and to have joint activities. And we already have partners such as Abbott and Sanofi and others to come. So before closing, I just want to draw your attention on uh, three activities which are recent. One, we have completely, uh, I would say, reinvigorated the website of GVN. And in particular, we have a web page which is fully dedicated to the vaccines against COVID-19, to the variants with questions and answers to the frequently questions which are being asked, uh, updated each day. And I can really tell you that uh, you can really find a lot of information, not only from scientific papers. Now, we would be very pleased to receive from you your feedback, criticisms, suggestions. We really believe that this web page provides a lot of information uh, as compared to uh, other source of uh, information. The second point is that we are now launching the GVN Academy. Education, training, this has been really at the heart of the GVN since its creation by Bob Gallo and Billy Hall, uh, now several years ago. And we all know, I mean, this is obvious, but this is so important, that COVID-19 has only uh, demonstrated again that the truth is that worldwide, worldwide, we have, we are lacking virologists. We need to train the new generation of virologists and we need to train them with a modern style, I would say. Very much transdisciplinary, very much also connected to entrepreneurships. So this is what the GVN Academy is about. Uh, and as you will see in the GVN newsletters, and this is also posted on our website, it combines actually several programs that I'm not going to detail. We have a program for the rising stars. We need to identify, we need to help, we need to nurture the next generation of virology. So I really encourage all of you to send, that's very easy, just a few lanes to send suggestions as to investigators, young and maybe some of them less young, where you feel 
they should be part of this training program and to really be part of, uh, of the group, which will be facing uh, the next epidemics. The second program is really, and all of this is related, a program of fellowships. We now have, and this is a very important move, thanks to, thanks to a very generous donation. We have the possibility to provide fellowships. Uh, the uh, the uh, uh, students, the, the postdoc, they will be able to, uh, to go from one center to the other if it is necessary. This can be connected to industrial partners. This should offer a lot of possibilities. Third, we will resume uh, as soon as this uh, COVID-19 will be over, the short course in Baltimore. This has been from the very beginning, extremely successful, has generated about 80, I believe, alumni. And uh, this is something which is extremely, extremely useful. And finally, we are also preparing an online course uh, to be complementary uh, to this short course. And that will be a partnership between uh, the GVN and the University of South Florida. Uh, so we, all the details have been posted. You have the deadlines. Uh, we really hope that you are going to take advantage of this, uh, of this program. So having said that, I now hand over to Shin Hee Kim for this seminar. And thank you again uh, so much, Scott. Scott, from the very beginning, very strong support for GVN, including with the Zika Task Force. Thank you. It is my great honor to introduce Dr. Scott Weber. Dr. Weber is the John Sealy Distinguished University Chair in Human Infection and Immunity at the University of Texas Medical Branch. He is also professor and chair of the Department of Microbiology and Immunology, director of the Institute for Human Infection and Immunity, and the scientific director of the Galveston National Laboratory. Dr. Weber is leading the Western Gulf Center of Excellence for Vector Bone Diseases, the West African Center for Emerging Infectious Diseases and the World Reference Center for Emerging Viruses and Arboviruses. Dr. Weber received his PhD in biology from the University of California, San Diego in 1993. He had a postdoctoral fellowship at Yale University School of Medicine. He joined his current department as a faculty member in 1994. Dr. Weber's research focuses on ecology, epidemiology, evolution, and the pathogenesis of arboviruses and the vaccine development, with more than 370 peer-reviewed research publications. Since the beginning of the pandemic, he has contributed his expertise to COVID-19 research. He has received many prestigious awards including the World Read Medal from the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, and the Robert Gallo Award for Scientific Excellence from the GVN. Dr. Weber is a fellow of the American Academy of Inventors, the American Academy of Microbiology, and the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. Dr. Weaver, thank you for taking your busy time and giving your talk today. Thank you. Thank you, Shin He, and also Kevin and, and Christian for organizing this series. Uh, I just want to start out by mentioning how far GVN has come the past, uh, I'd say, six or seven years since I've been involved. Um, I'm thinking back to the really the first epidemic, uh, the chikungunya epidemic, and then Zika. The response to this coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic by the GVN has really been so much stronger and comprehensive and effective, I believe, thanks to the leadership of three, three individuals here today. So I'm gonna share my screen and get started. If, uh, 
If anybody does not see it now, please let me know. So I'm gonna be talking uh, this morning about some of the work we've been doing for the past few months on uh, studying the variants of SARS-CoV-2 that have evolved uh, over the past uh, year or so. And uh, I'll start out with a disclaimer. I don't have any conflicts of interest to declare. To declare. And I also wanna point out, I'm not a real coronavirologist. Like many of us, I'm an opportunistic coronavirologist. I've been drinking from the same fire hose that many of you have, have for the last year, trying to keep up with the amazing pace of science and focusing in a few areas like the evolution of the virus. So this is a, a figure that comes from the, the magazine called The Economist that I think is a nice depiction of the evolution of the variants that we're all interested in. Starting at the top here, which would be the presumably point source introduction of the virus uh, somewhere in China into the human population, and then evolution proceeding downward. Uh, there are a lot of variants that have occurred and in, in the strictest sense, a variant can be any single, even a single nucleotide mutation in the genome you could call a variant. But I think the, the field has generally uh, uh, centered on variants being uh, lineages, usually with several mutations and mutations that could be of some concern uh, from the standpoint of controlling the outbreak and especially from vaccination. So I'm gonna be just discussing a few of these today that I think are, are the most important in many people's minds. I'm gonna start out with a mutation in the spike protein gene that occurred early on, about a year ago, uh, at the beginning of the outbreak, evolving in aspartic acid to glycine at 614 in the spike that was associated with increased transmissibility. I'm gonna mention just a little bit about this B1351 uh, variant that evolved in South Africa and has been spreading around the world in the past few months. I'll be talking about that mainly in the context of its susceptibility to vaccine-induced immunity. There are two other uh, of these variants that we have not begun to study as intensively from New York and California here. And then most of my talk will be on this variant called B117 that evolved in England starting late last summer, uh, increased dramatically in frequency there and then began spreading around the globe, including here into the United States and many other places. And then finally down here is a variant from Brazil called P1 that uh, appears to have evolved in Brazil. It's been associated with major epidemics there uh, in the last few months. You probably read in the newspapers about Manaus, for example, experiencing a really devastating outbreak where they literally couldn't keep up with supplies of oxygen to care for patients. And I'll just be talking about that one as well in the context of, of immunity. So these variants have been of great concern to a lot of people, even the popular press have picked up on these a lot. And there are two main reasons we worry about these. First is that uh, several of them are associated with increased transmission efficiency in their place of origin. And the concern is that even though we're making a lot of progress, for example, here in the US and a few other countries uh, in our vaccination programs and herd immunity is growing quickly, uh, these, this increased transmission efficiency uh, could counteract that herd immunity, especially if, if we start letting our guard down with the public health measures like masking and distancing that, that help to control that normal spread. And so there's a concern that these could result in a, another wave of infections in many places around the world uh, later this year. And then the second one is that these variants might be able to resist immunity that's generated either from uh, vaccination with the, the vaccines that were all developed uh, using strains of the coronavirus spike protein that were present at the very beginning of the outbreak. And also uh, even with natural infection, which uh, occurred prior to the last few months with, from similar strains of the virus that were there at the beginning, there could be uh, the problem that these variants um, are not quite as effectively neutralized or controlled by immunity generated from wild type or vaccination. And this could lead also to a resurgence in cases. So just a very quick uh, update uh, review on the, the uh, structure of the SARS coronavirus 2. Coronaviruses um, 
have four structural proteins, uh, the spike protein, which I'll be talking mostly about, the nucleocapsid, which combines with the RNA genome of about 30 uh, nucleotides of single-stranded positive sense RNA to form the nucleocapsid in the center of the particle. Then the envelope here shown in purple contains two proteins, the membrane and the envelope proteins. And, and then uh, finally, the spike is embedded at the tip of its stalk into that uh, envelope and projects outward and includes uh, most of the important functions for entry and the ability of antibodies to neutralize the virus. So down uh, here below is the crystal structure of the spike trimer, which uh, uh, is three copies of the spike protein with this uh, stalk-like lower part here, which would be next to the the envelope down below, and then the head up here at the top. And then this receptor binding domain shown in the box here. This uh, uh, reacts and binds to the main human receptor, which is called angiotensin converting enzyme 2 or ACE2 receptor to allow the virus to bind to cells and then to gain entry through receptor mediated endocytosis. Looking down here at the uh, uh, genetic map of the spike protein gene. I just want to point out a few key features. First of all, there's a cleavage site between the two main domains of the protein called S1 and S2. This is a furin cleavage site, so cellular enzymes cleave the protein uh, nearly in half here. And this cleavage site uh, turns out to be quite important for uh, infection and pathogenesis. One uh, really puzzling feature of SARS-CoV-2 compared to all other closely related SARS coronaviruses is, is right next to this cleavage site shown in the, the red amino acids here, there's a polybasic stretch of amino acids that's unique to SARS-CoV-2. Even SARS-CoV-1 is missing this uh, stretch of amino acids as well as other close relatives like the pangolin uh, coronaviruses, which are very close to SARS-CoV-2 and some of the bat close relatives. So uh, how this, uh, this uh, four codons evolved in the SARS-CoV-2 genome is still a mystery, whether it somehow was a spontaneous insertion, which tends to be very rare in RNA virus genomes, or probably more likely some kind of recombination event that put this uh, stretch of 12 nucleotides into the genome, we really don't understand yet. Then back down here to the map, the, the receptor binding motif down here at positions 437 to 509. That's the part in the box up here on the structure. And then a few other repeated sequences uh, of interest down here as well. So I'm going to start out by just talking briefly about this 614 mutation. So if we look at the 614 uh, position in genomic sequences generated worldwide from SARS-CoV-2, and the, the prolific generation of genomic sequences is really quite uh, impressive for SARS-CoV-2. There are now well over 300,000 complete genomes. So even in, in the early part of the outbreak, there was a lot of sequencing going out going on. And so shown here in orange is the aspartic acid residue, the ancestral residue. And about late February, this glycine variant began to appear. And you can see that it increased in frequency very rapidly to about 70% or so of the population within only a few weeks. And then gradually, the uh, aspartic acid variant disappeared and the glycine residue became completely dominant. We, we usually think of this as a selective sweep, where if there's a positive selection for one variant over another, it will outcompete that initial variant and sweep through the population to become dominant. So that's what appeared to be happening from the early epidemiologic data. We wanted to look at that more experimentally, and we, we used the hamster model to do this work. And I'm just going to review a few of the data from this uh, 614 residue, because this has already been published a few months ago in this paper by uh, Jessica Plant and others from our group. So first of all, um, we, we were also interested in knowing whether this mutation might affect the virulence of the virus for humans. And so the hamster model um, tends to be a non-lethal infection like human infections. The animals do lose weight very consistent, consistently. And so the simplest readout for morbidity is weight loss. And you'll see here in these experiments where animals were either mock infected 
or infected with the aspartic acid or the glycine variants. These are in the, the isogenic background of the cDNA clone system that was generated here in February of last year. You'll see that these animals are still growing. They're fairly young, five to six week old hamsters. And either the, the aspartic acid or the glycine does cause weight loss in these animals. They eventually do rebound. If you keep them beyond a week, they get, they get back close to the normal weight. And you can see here that there doesn't seem to be very much of any uh, consistent difference between the two residues. It's possible that even that the aspartic acid um, is a little bit more attenuated than the, uh, the uh, glycine residue, but these are not significant differences here. And then what we did with these animals, we sampled a, a variety of different uh, sites and tissues in their respiratory tract and compared the replication of these two variants in the hamsters. And what you'll see here is that the only significant difference here when we sample the nasal washes, the trachea, the lungs, uh, several different parts of the lungs, the only significant difference is in the nasal washes that we take at four days after infection here. And uh, that difference is also borne out when we do infections of another model system primary human airway epithelial cells, which can be purchased commercially. They grow in a polarized manner. And when we infect those with the two variants, you can see that we, we consistently see higher titers at time points from days one through five after infection with the glycine variant compared to the aspartic acid. What's interesting is when we, when we do this assay with plaque forming units, infectious units, we see this highly significant difference. When we do the, the uh, comparison using real-time PCR, so we're measuring genome equivalents, we don't see any significant difference. And the reason for this we worked out in this project is that the specific infectivity of the glycine variant is about double that of the aspartic acid variant. So it, does, it may be replicating a little bit better too, but it's generating more infectious virus. And so it's able to spread more efficiently uh, due to that higher specific infectivity of the virions that are generated. So now I'm going to spend uh, most of the rest of the time talking about this B117 variant, also known as the UK variant. This variant uh, emerged in September of last year. It was noted in a certain part of England. And uh, epidemiologists and sequencers and modelers followed this very closely in the UK and noticed that it was increasing very rapidly in frequency in the population, and also that transmission was becoming apparently more efficient at the same time in the UK. It's since spread to more than uh, 30 different countries, uh, including here in the United States. We've been monitoring these variants for the last couple months, and this variant has gone from uh, barely detectable about six weeks ago to now over 15% of our cases here in the Galveston area are the UK variants. So this is entirely consistent with what's been seen in the UK. And I suspect that this UK variant here in the United States is going to be the dominant variant within weeks. And, um, and the implications for that will become apparent as I continue through the presentation. So the, the modelers in the UK uh, predicted roughly a 70% increase in transmissibility with this variant. So more efficient, perhaps more rapid transmission, which of course is always bad uh, during this pandemic. And at the beginning, there was really no difference in clinical outcomes noted, but uh, the last month or so, a number of clinicians in the UK have noted that there seemed to be some more serious uh, outcomes of infection with the UK variant than with what, what I'm gonna refer to as the wild type. In other words, the pre-UK, original uh, sequence of the virus that was in the UK before this variant emerged, including that 614 mutation that I just showed you, but which has been present in more or less the wild type for the last nine months or so. So the UK variant has 19 different mutations in, in its genome, and eight of these encode substitutions or deletions within the spike protein. And this is what we're seeing with many of the variants. It's a lot of the mutations are focused in that spike protein gene, which as I showed you, interacts with cellular receptors to mediate infection. So for this project, we started out with the cDNA clone system. Uh, first of all, we put the uh, 614 glycine codon uh, into the spike 
uh, gene of that. And that's what I'm going to refer to from here on as the wild type. So this is the original sequence from a Washington, the first Washington state uh, isolate way back in February with the addition of the 614 uh, mutation. Then these are the eight uh, other mutations that we studied. So we very simply put these individually into the spike uh, gene through a mutagenesis, typical mutagenesis. And then we also combine all eight of these mutations into a, another clone that I'm gonna refer to as UK8X. So this has the, the complete uh, spike gene from the UK strain, at least all of the uh, amino acids are the same. Over here on the right is, is again the crystal structure of the spike protein, the trimeric form. And what you can see here is the locations of all these. You'll notice that only one of these, the, the 501 position, is in this receptor binding domain. Uh, others are in other domains of the head or even down here in the stalk below. Now I need to spend a little time explaining to you the way that we assess the fitness of these mutants experimentally. And this is a method that we've been using for a long time with arboviruses. It's a variation of methods to design long time ago by people like my mentor, John Holland and, and others using monoclonal escape markers. Now we do it uh, through genetics. So what we do is we take uh, a mutant and the progenitor of that mutant, uh, which I call the wild type, and we generate those from the cDNA clones. So they're, they're isogenic. They only differ by that one mutation. And then we rescue the viruses and we mix them in a roughly one-to-one -one ratio in infectious units uh, into a mixture that we use to inoculate our experimental systems. So first of all, we take some of that virus mixture and we do an RT-PCR reaction that spans the mutation that we've made into the uh, mutant here. And then we take the amplicon that we generate and we do uh, old fashioned Sanger sequencing. And what we do then is this is an example of, uh, of the, the uh, A peak in one virus and the C peak in the other. And then the mixture has a combination of these two peaks that you can see on the bottom here. And that mixture, we can quantify the amount in each of those two nucleotides from the electropherogram data generated by the uh, Sanger sequencing reaction. So then once we confirm that the ratio is close to one to one here, we take a different aliquot of our mixture, we infect cell cultures, we infect animals, and then after appropriate periods of incubation, we harvest samples from those experimental systems. We do the same RT-PCR, the same sequencing reaction, and we look to see if this ratio has changed from one to one to something that's significantly different than one-to-one. -one. So why do we do, do this instead of just infecting a lot of mice with one strain, a lot of mice with the other strain, or the same thing with cell cultures, and generate data like I showed you in the previous example from the 614 mutation? Well, the reason is this is a much more efficient and we believe more sensitive way to see small differences in fitness. And, and uh, so we analyze these samples by we take the, the ratio of the mutant to wild type that goes into the system, what comes out in the system, we divide uh, the final by the original, and we test the null hypothesis that there's no difference, that the final divided by the uh, initial ratio is no different than one. In other words, there's no effect of this particular mutant on fitness. And if we do see a significant difference, then we know that there's some kind of effect, which we usually uh, repeat follow up on to make sure it's consistent. The, the major advantages of this are, first of all, the experiments are all internally controlled. So these viruses in the mixture are all replicating in the same cell population or the same animal. And that reduces the, the variation from cell bottle to cell bottle or animal to animal that results in a lot of loss of power in traditional experiments. Um, so it's very sensitive and reproducible. We've done experiments where we resample these populations over and over again, very consistent ratios. And so this allows us to do experiments with far fewer replicates, fewer animals, which makes everybody happy, fewer cells, which saves a lot of cost. And we can get results much faster and, and we believe with more precision this way. 
So first of all, back to the eight mutants that I showed you. Uh, these are plaque assays done with each of those eight mutants, as well as with the UK8X over here on the lower right. And you'll notice compared to the wild type, there are really no consistent differences in plaque morphology here. Some of them might be slightly smaller overall, but uh, generally they produce very similar plaques, no obvious differences that would uh, lead us to believe that one of these mutations might be involved in virulence in, vi in vivo, or, uh, in vitro rather, or attenuation. So uh, with the, the results from these plaque assays, we proceeded with the experiments showing, uh, like I showed you in the last figure. So the way these experiments are mostly done is we use the hamster model. It's a very good model in several respects. First of all, it's uh, readily infected by wild type SARS-CoV-2. We don't have to use rodent adapted viruses like with some of the mouse models. Um, the, the histopathological findings and the distribution of virus in the respiratory tract is very similar to what's seen in human infections. And um, these animals are also very susceptible to, to transmission within a cage from one hamster to another. And that we use to model transmission among people. So we start these experiments in four to six week old hamsters, uh, mixed gender. And we inoculate them intranasally. Usually we use about 10 to the four plaque forming units of these mixtures or individual strains. And then we wait one day. That's uh, the, the time required to have a high titer of virus in the nasal cavities. Then we take uh, the, the infected mouse and we co-house it with the recipient mouse. So we call that first one the donor, the second one the recipient. We give them a few hours for transmission to occur in the cage. Then we separate them again. We follow the donor hamsters out to four days, including sampling them with uh, nasal washes uh, on each of these four days. And then we also sample the trachea and the lungs four days after infection, sometimes more frequently. Then for the donor, we stagger the experiment by one day because they don't become infected until uh, one day after the donors, and then we do the same collection of nasal washes and tissues before these animals are euthanized out here on day five total, but day four for the recipients. And so we, we measure the titers of virus in all these sites using traditional plaque assays, sometimes also using real time PCR in both the donors and the recipients. So these are some results from the nasal washes of these hamsters that have been inoculated with a mixture of wild type in each of these mutants here, or wild type in the UK8X mutant here. And what you're seeing on the graphs here are the ratio of viruses in five individual animals shown by these uh, red circles here. And then the, uh, the, the uh, cat's eye plot shows you the mean and the standard error in gray here for each of these distributions. And what we're interested in is, are any of these significantly different than one, the original ratio that went into the inoculum? And in fact, a few of these are. The 69 to 70 uh, deletion appears to have gone up significantly in frequency along with 501. 501 shows the greatest difference uh, with a, a factor of about two here. Uh, then one of these uh, mutations at 716 seems to reduce the frequency compared to the wild type in this mixed infection, a slight increase, 982. Uh, and then uh, for the 8X here, a similar increase to what we saw with the 501 here, close to two. When we look at the recipient hamsters, we see that the differences tend to be a little bit more pronounced, partly because there may be a difference in the efficiency of transmission from one animal to the other, partly because we're going through uh, an extra one day of replication, uh, including the donor one day and then the recipient four days. And you'll see now that we see the same overall pattern, although the, the 6970 deletion has less of an impact. 501 has an even greater impact, very similar again to the 8X difference here. So, so overall, we're seeing a major effect by 8X and 501 and inconsistent effects with a few of the other mutations. These are the results from the trachea and another measure of the upper airway in these animals. An upper airway is where we think most of the transmission uh, originates from in, in uh, small droplets or aerosols, uh, or even in contamination of surface fomites through uh, 
to people touching things with contaminated hands from their nasal and oral secretions. So uh, again, these are, these are sampled only on day four, and you'll see a, a similar but slightly different pattern than what we saw in the nasal washes. Once again, 501 has the, the biggest phenotype here with a relative uh, replicated fitness value of three. This is just the ratio between final and original uh, in the samples. We also see 570 has a phenotype for the trachea as well as uh, 716. Again, a slight decline for 982. And this time, uh, 1118 also shows a decline. But once again, ADEX and uh, 501 are nearly identical here. And the recipients, once again, it's a little bit more pronounced, possibly due to transmission or just that extra day of replication. But more or less a similar pattern with 501, uh, 570, and ADEX having positive fitness values and 982 a negative value here. Now in the lungs, we saw actually quite a different pattern. Uh, so looking at the lower respiratory tract here, uh, again, this is, uh, these are samples taken four days after infection or four days after transmission in the recipients. You'll see that uh, even for 501 here, there was no significant effect in the donors, a slightly significant effect in the recipients. 570 had a stronger effect only in the recipients. And then uh, only in the donors, 681 didn't carry over to the recipients. And again, a, a negative impact on fitness of this 982 mutation. Sorry, it's blocked by my, uh, my menu here. So uh, a, a quite, a, quite a bit of difference between the lungs and the upper respiratory tract in the fitness of these viruses to replicate and generate viral loads and, and lung tissues. So um, the, the consistent uh, result from the 501 mutation was not really surprising because of several reasons. First of all, when you look at all of these mutations we're testing here, their amino acid positions here, the amino acid changes here, uh, they were all almost, almost completely present in every isolate from the UK since uh, early last fall. But you'll notice that when we look for the presence of all these mutations in other variants, we do find the 6970 deletion in these Denmark isolates that came from the mink farms. Um, and we see the 614 mutation in the South Africa, Denmark, and Brazil, and the California variants here. But the, uh, the 501 mutation was found in the other two variants of major concern, South Africa and Brazil here. And so we were, we were not surprised that this might have a phenotype for increased uh, efficiency of transmission and perhaps also in uh, ability to be neutralized by uh, antibodies, which we had not tested yet. The other thing that we noticed, looking at the presence of 501 worldwide in every one of these hundreds of thousands of SARS-CoV-2 sequences, you'll notice here beginning in the fall that not just in the UK, but worldwide, they go from a very low frequency to over 90% uh, the last we compiled these data in February of this year. So this mutation, it not only was selective in the UK, but it's being selected worldwide at a very rapid rate similar to what we saw with the uh, 614 mutation that I showed you earlier that went through this selective sweep uh, in the global population. So we wanted to hone in on 501 for some of our other experiments for these reasons. And so what we did is we looked a little bit more carefully at the kinetics of replication uh, in the same hamster model using uh, only the 501 mutation in these experiments. So the first thing we did was to look at um, four consecutive days of shedding into the nasal cavity during these washes. And we noticed that we did not see a significant change until day three in these samples, when uh, as expected, the frequency of the mutant compared to the wild type in these mixtures started to increase. And by day four, it was up to that two level that I showed you in the original data for day four. But in the recipients, uh, even after only one day following the transmission event, uh, they maintain this highly significant fitness value. You'll notice that the population that was transmitted, which is represented by day one in the donors, uh, had increased quite a bit by day one in the recipients. So it's possible that this mutant is also transmitted more efficiently 
and then further increase in its frequency because it, as in the donors, it does also replicate in the upper respiratory tract more, uh, more efficiently. Uh, then down here, looking at the trachea and the donors and recipients on two time points, days two and four, you'll see the same uh, kind of trend. By day two, we see a significant advantage for the, the mutant. It increases by day four uh, in both the, the, uh, the donors and the recipients. The, the day two in the recipients is higher than the day two in the donors, possibly reflecting that more efficient transmission. We really need to follow up on, on that with ID50 studies to see if the 501 makes the virus more infectious for these animals. Looking at the lungs, uh, as, as I showed you before, the, the uh, results are quite different. We see no effect on fitness in the, lung, in the donor lungs. We do see in the recipients, but this could also be related to a difference in transmission efficiency, like I speculated for the other data as well. So, we don't really know if overall the, the, the mutant does have some kind of fitness advantage in the lungs or it just gets transmitted more efficiently from one animal to another and therefore it's more frequent in the lungs based on the, the founder population. Then we also did some work. We really wanted to use a system with genuine human ACE2 receptors. So we used these uh, human epithelial airway cell cultures uh, to do some additional studies. We began by doing simple experiments where we infect a, a triplicate, or in this case, uh, six different replicates of these infections with either the wild type or the 501 uh, mutant or the 8X mutant that I showed you before. And we simply look at the kinetics of replication over five days here. And what you'll see uh, very closely mirrors what I showed you in the hamsters. For the first two days, we see that uh, the 501 mutant uh, does replicate significantly faster than the wild type. Um, in the first day, it's very close to that of the 8X. Um, it's a little bit lower, but not significantly lower on day two compared to the 8X. And then the wild type catches up and we see no difference in the final three days. Probably the mutant uh, and, and the 8X are just slowing down in their replication by this point in these uh, interferon competent cell cultures. If we do the same experiment using the competition method, you'll see that the results are significant through all five days here. Um, and we, we generally see a little bit more sensitivity to detect differences using the competition assay. But once this difference is established, there's no indication, assuming that there's not as much replication going on, that one virus is more stable than the other using this or other measures we've used. So we also wanted to get at this question of virulence. As I mentioned, uh, clinicians in the UK are seeing what they believe are, uh, are differences in virulence where the UK variant produces more severe hospitalized cases. So we just uh, used the simplest uh, readout for virulence in our hamster model, which is weight loss. And like I showed you in, in the first graph in our 614 experiments, these animals, when they're mock infected, continue to gain weight. When they're infected with any strain we've used, they lose weight. In this particular case, although it's not significant, there does seem to be a consistent trend where either the 501 or the 8X animals are losing more weight than those infected with the mock. We really need to increase the, the, the cohort size here to see if this is a significant difference or not, but it could reflect what the, the clinicians have been speculating that this 501 mutation is increasing the virulence of SARS-CoV-2 at least a little bit in this model. So again, homing in on 501, what could be the mechanism of this increased replication and possibly uh, increased infectivity? So looking uh, again at the crystal structure, this is the interface between the spike receptor binding domain shown in purple and the ACE2 uh, protein here shown in gray. And you'll see that at position uh, 353 in ACE2, there's, there's an interaction with position 501 uh, in the spike uh, uh, head of the protein here. And when the virus changes from asparagine to tyrosine here, that, uh, that brings it into closer proximity with the 353 residue that extends out here. So it may be that this closer interaction between these two residues enhances binding of the 
the spike to the receptor. And we tested that experimentally with collaborators at the University of Houston who do this very elegant biolayer interferometry uh, assay to measure the kinetics and the, uh, the strength of the union between these two proteins. And what they found was that uh, comparing the, the, uh, the proteins, these are expressed in bacteria with the tyrosine versus the asparagine uh, in at 501 position with uh, the receptor binding domain of ACE2, uh, that tyrosine residue in, in, uh, has a 350 fold improved KD and greater than 800 fold improved K off value for this interaction. So that individual mutation does make a big difference in the binding affinity for the receptor protein. Now I want to finish up by just talking a little bit about the effect of the variants on the ability of human immunity to control uh, infection and spread going forward. And there's good news and bad news so far in this story. The good news is that several studies uh, taking antisera from clinical trial participants. This is an example on the upper graph here of work uh, done by our group here with the Pfizer clinical trial sera. So uh, serum samples shown by individual data points here uh, are simply taken and a, a neutralization assay is done with a number of different SARS-CoV-2 variants to see if there are differences in the endpoint titers. And these are 50% endpoint titers. You can see for what we call the wild type, the original Washington strain, the, the mean titer is up here somewhere around four or 500. Uh, good news is that the UK variant doesn't seem to have any impact on neutralization here. The, the mean is, is slightly, but not significantly higher. And the P1 doesn't seem to have a dramatic impact either. The bad news is that the South Africa B1351 does have a significant reduction in the endpoint titer with these sera. In, in our experiments, it's about two to three fold on average, which is pretty small difference in the world of virology. Certainly a smaller difference than we would expect to see with um, vaccine derived immunity against many viruses that are much more diverse than SARS-CoV-2, like for example, yellow fever or rubella. Um, and then adding in additional mutations like 614 here didn't seem to have much impact either. Down below here, these are data from patients in the UK during the early phase of the outbreak who, who developed natural infection and their convalescent sera was tested using the Victoria strain, which is the UK version of our wild type. It's a very early isolate there. And then the B1351, this is the South African variant of most concern. And you'll notice here that the shift is, is a little bit greater than we saw. It averages between around three and uh, tenfold uh, lower uh, neutralization uh, titers against this variant compared with the homologous titers against the Victoria variant. So this is a little bit more concerning, but in the same ballpark that we saw with the, the vaccine serum, that there's a slight reduction in neutralization titers, but not a major dramatic reduction in either vaccine derived or naturally infect, infected people. The bad news is, though is that uh, in the AstraZeneca Oxford clinical trial in South Africa, apparently it completely failed to protect against this South African variant and that was discontinued in South Africa. And uh, a little bit of better news is that a more recent trial, the Norovax trial seems to, to have about 50% protection against this variant. So it may be that some vaccines do better than others. Uh, another concern is uh, data reported from Manaus, Brazil, which has been the, the worst hit part of Brazil recently with COVID outbreaks. Um, they have an interesting history where they had a major spike last summer, the things slowed down during the fall, but then they've had a, an even bigger spike the last uh, month or two with this new Brazil uh, variant taking over. And they've estimated that um, from epidemiologic data and modeling that probably somewhere between 25 and 61% of people uh, who recovered from infection last summer with the wild type strain were reinfected with this new P1 variant during the recent outbreak. And so that's an indication that, um, that uh, human immunity from the original wild type strain, especially after six months uh, between outbreaks, uh, that immunity and ability to cross protect may be waning 
and we could uh, expect to see that coming uh, in our part of the world, for example, uh, six months after the peak of vaccination, which is about right now, we would be concerned about the same sort of thing happening with the Brazil variant. So just the major conclusions, uh, the 614 substitution enhances transmission, including via greater specific infectivity of viral particles. For the UK variant, it seems like only two, mainly the 501, but also probably the 6970 deletion is playing a, a role too. We're doing more experiments with that as well as with the combination. We may we may be seeing some synergy between these two mutations, but these are probably the main determinants of increased transmission in this UK variant. Uh, the way I like to think of this, I'm, I'm looking for reasons to call the glass half full here, is that in a way it's sort of good news. If all eight of these spike substitutions were having significant contributions to this transmissibility phenotype, we'd, we'd be expecting eight more to come in the coming uh, three or four months and maybe eight more after that. And we might not uh, view, view ourselves as being anywhere close to being out of the woods with these variants emerging. But because it's only two point mutations, mainly one that occurred uh, about six months ago, this suggests that, that the virus may only have limited possibilities of a few different point mutations to allow it to become much more transmissible. So the 614 would be one, 501 would be another, but maybe the virus is having a harder time finding additional mutations as it continues to replicate and mutate. Uh, and that could be uh, good news for us if, if the, the appearance of these variants starts to uh, slow down, at least in their ability to increase transmission. So the spike 501 tyrosine appears to be the main determinant. It improves fitness for replication in the upper airway, probably not in the lower airway, uh, uh, possibly also enhanced transmission. We need to determine that for sure with in infectivity assays with individual strains. And uh, this is all mediated through this spike receptor interaction. There appears to be some potential for escape of the South African variant, both from vaccine induced and, and from naturally acquired immunity, especially after uh, many months when immunity may be waning. And then uh, with growing herd immunity, I think it's likely that we're probably up to around 45% of people in the US who have had at least one uh, vaccination or were naturally infected. Um, I think the main risk going forward is that more and more herd immunity means more and more pressure on the virus to find mutations that allow it to escape that immunity. So I think we have to be very vigilant in the coming months when we even increase immunity further with the, the high rate of vaccinations going on, that we may see uh, more escape mutants and we may need to generate modified vaccines to uh, control these escape mutants. Fortunately, that's already going on. In fact, even clinical trials are going on with some of the RNA vaccines with a, a modified variant based on the South African sequence. And then just to conclude, the people in my group who did most of the work I showed you were Jessica and Ken Plant. They also manage the reference center, which probably many of you have used to get your hands on a lot of these viruses on viral RNA to set up the diagnostics last year. And then Jun uh, Ying Liu, from our group. And then we work very closely with Peyong Shi and scientists in his group here. Peyong has, has uh, done most of the uh, reverse, uh, uh, reverse genetics engineering of a lot of these clones. He put the system together in the first place with Vineet Manicheri, shown here. Uh, they've tended to do a lot of our in vitro assays. We focus more on the in vivo studies. Vineet, unlike Peyong and myself, is a real coronavirologist, so we go to him for a lot of great advice on designing these experiments and providing help. And then we also collaborate with Alex Freiberg, who's also been working with the hamster system, and then our two collaborators from Houston who did those binding assays I showed you. So thanks for your attention, and I'm happy to try to take your questions. Thank you for excellent presentation, Dr. Weaver. And uh, we'll see how many questions we have received from the audience. So let's see. Okay. okay the first question is that, can new insight be provided regarding the competitive risk 
a competitive risk level associated with E484Q and L452R dual mutant variant reported from India? Well, we haven't done any work with that Indian mutation. I can't really comment on that. For 484, um, several of those variants, you, if you remember from the table I showed, you do have 484, including Brazil and South Africa. So those, uh, those, uh, that substitution is probably playing a major role in uh, the loss of uh, certain antibodies, uh, ability to neutralize that virus. Um, We've also done some work with individual mutations that I didn't show you uh, with, within uh, these neutralization studies and 484 is playing a big role there. Um, whether it's playing a major role in, in uh, upper respiratory infection and transmission, I would say um, we don't know yet because we're just starting to work with that Brazil and South African variant doing the same kind of hamster experiments that I showed you before. Uh, I, I will speculate a, a little bit and say, I suspect it's not as important as 501 because 501 has such a dramatic uh, impact and there's really no evidence that the South African or Brazil strains are more transmissible than UK. They're not spreading faster. They've both been here in the United States for several weeks, but they're not spreading faster than UK. So I would speculate that 484 may not be as important for human-to-human uh, -human transmission as 501, but we don't know for sure. Next question is that, apart from sequencing the SARS-CoV-2 mutant genomes, what other methods have you used to confirm the mutant strain transmissibility? Well, uh, you know, our work has been strictly experimental uh, with the human cells, uh, the hamsters, um, we, we've also done work with a few other cell lines that I didn't show you, um, and we find a very consistent phenotypes, especially between the human cells and the hamsters. Um, we, uh, our group doesn't do a lot of epidemiologic modeling. That's been done by others to, to make the connection between the rapid rise of these variants and, and higher R sub naught values for the efficiency of spread in the population. But I think those are the main lines of evidence uh, about these mutants. Um, we are looking very carefully in our own hospitals and clinics here at the outcomes of patients with the UK versus the wild type variant. And our, our clinicians are, are very interested in, in looking to see if they can detect any consistent differences. Um, there's, you know, there's an association recently with some of these variants infecting younger age groups, causing more severe disease in younger age groups that we're keeping a close eye on. But that could just be related to the fact that, um, that younger age groups have not yet been vaccinated in, in the United States, for example, that younger age groups are not as concerned about getting infected with the virus. So they're not as careful about protecting themselves with masking and distancing. And, and younger people just getting infected at much higher rates now than older age groups. So we, we, really, we really need more uh, direct information coming out of clinical outcomes, hospitalized versus non-hospitalized cases, things like that. And as the UK variant increases in frequency here in the US, we're gonna have a better opportunity to make those comparisons when the frequencies are similar. You just said recombinant sequences in the competition hidden is the assay. I, I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. This is the recombinant sequences in the competition hidden is the assay. Oh, recombination during the competition. I guess that's the question. Yes, in fact, a couple of times when we've when we've seen unusual results or unexpected results. We take the, uh, the virus population at uh, usually day four is our last sampling time point. And we do some deep sequencing of some of these in our experiments. And we have a collaborator, Andrew Routh, who's a real expert in looking for recombination. Uh, he uses methods uh, called ClickSeq that um, are designed to improve the ability to find recombination. And we've never seen any recombination during one of these experiments. There's a lot of recombination it's probably going on in nature, but we haven't seen it confounding the uh, results of our experiments yet. To what extent the result obtained on the model system you use 
can be applied to what happened in the human organism in vivo? Well, I mean, it's certainly not a, a perfect model. Uh, first of all, we don't see severe COVID. We don't see this uh, hyperactive inflammatory response that causes the major disease in people. Um, we don't see chronic shedding of virus from the nasal cavities like has been documented in many people. Um, I'm sure there are many other differences too. We don't see multi-organ involvement. Um, you know, we don't see changes in, in the uh, function of, of the, uh, the kidneys and the heart and other organs that have been seen many times in people. So it's certainly not a perfect model, but I think especially when used in combination with the mouse model, where uh, with the transgenic mice, you have the authentic human receptor. We're, our main concern with the hamsters is that the hamster receptor is a little bit different and some of these interactions could be extremely specific only for the human receptor. So we're starting to do a little bit more work with the mouse model. Of course, the non-human primate models are probably the best overall, but uh, obviously you can't do these kind of experiments with hundreds of animals um, using non-human primates. So we think that the, the hamsters represent a good uh, compromise between uh, use of animals, cost, uh, uh, duration of experiments, and uh, combined with the mouse models, I think we're in a good, pretty good position to try to understand some of these interactions. Is it possible that the appearance of the mutant strain showed that people became resistant to the original strain? So resistant to immunity generated by the original strain, I assume that means. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's exactly what um, the experiments I showed you uh, with those many small graphs from the UK uh, were doing. They took convalescent serum from uh, many people uh, soon after infection with the wild type strain, mostly last spring and summer in the UK. And then they did neutralization assays with all the variants and so the major variants at least, and looked at their ability to neutralize the homologous virus from UK early outbreak and these variants emerging later. And they did see a, a consistent difference between the South African strain and the wild type strain. What hasn't been done, I think will be very important going forward is um, we haven't yet had the chance to look at human sera a long time after infection. So for example, the, in the Pfizer clinical trial, the six month sera from the phase three volunteers are now being analyzed for their ability to neutralize the, the wild type strain that the vaccine was designed for, as well as all these variants. I think that will tell us a lot more. I think the, my, my particular uh, speculation would be that, that soon after vaccination, we're not going to have a lot of trouble protecting people from any of these variants. But when we go six months out, I suspect that this difference between homologous and heterologous protection will become more apparent and protection against the variants could disappear altogether. So I think that's what I'm looking for next to, to tell us what we need to prepare for, um, say, by the summer when a lot of people in the US who were vaccinated are reaching that six month time point and, uh, and the major January spike in natural infections will also be reaching the same time point. So I think it's too early to know what will happen in the long run. I, I wouldn't be surprised though, if we, if we are having uh, boosters next fall for most people and even combined influenza SARS-CoV-2 uh, vaccination annually uh, as we have for flu for many, many years. Does the vaccination of the COVAX will register the mutating virus? I'm sure you said the vac vaccination of what? COVAX, C-O-V-A-X, COVAX. Sorry, your voice is dropping out uh, during, during that. Yeah, does the vaccination of the COVAX, C-O-V-A-X, will register mutating virus? Vaccination with? COVAX. Oh, COVAX. Yeah. So this is, this is one of the vaccines made in, in China? Okay. Well, so there are a lot of different platforms being used for the, these vaccines. Some of the vaccines made in China are made with the adenovirus platform, the same as uh, Johnson & Johnson, which is now being used in the US, uh, same as uh, AstraZeneca. 
Uh, some of the vaccines there are inactivated virus. And then uh, uh, I don't know how many other companies are making messenger RNA vaccines, but um, from I, I'm not familiar with every bit of data on all these vaccines from the clinical trials. I think all of them show a range of efficacy from a little over 50% to uh, 94, 95% with the mRNA vaccines. What's really important is the efficacy against severe hospitalized patients, which they all tend to be a little bit closer in their range of protection. Um, but I can't comment directly on one, an individual one of those vaccines. I'm just not familiar enough with the data other than for the US approved vaccines and a few others that are, uh, that are being used uh, in, in places like AstraZeneca. Why do you think that you got lower reduction of a post vaccination against the B1351 neutralization titer than others? Yeah, we don't know. I think that many people would have speculated that the 484 mutation was driving those differences because it occurs in a, a site of known uh, monoclonal antibody binding. But on the other hand, both, uh, both the South African and Brazil variants have that uh, same 484 mutation. And uh, the Brazil uh, virus doesn't seem to be able to overcome Im immunity as well as the South African virus. So there's probably more to it than 484. And we're working on experiments now looking at these individual mutations to try to tease apart all these possibilities. Uh, this takes a lot of time when there's so many mutations in the spike to go through. But I suspect we'll have an answer to that within uh, weeks or a month or two. Neutralization serology, you, de you, you decaded over avovirus serology tell you that primary responses tend to be type specific, whereas multiple immunization broadened immunity. How does this apply to two shot SARS CoV 2 vaccine, possibly being better than one time infection or single shot vaccine? Yeah, I, I really don't want to say too much about that. I'm really not an expert in immunology. Um, I, I, I certainly think that um, the, the data we've seen from AstraZeneca, from uh, Johnson & Johnson rather, which is the only single shot vaccine being used here in the US, um, they certainly look very good at an early point after vaccination, um, the, the antibody responses. I think that it's true that theoretically there could be an advantage to going in with a booster in terms of the breadth of the immune response, uh, especially if you wait even longer, that tends to uh, uh, improve that breadth uh, due to the maturation of, of memory cells and other processes. But I think it's, it's too early to know whether that's really gonna be a meaningful difference or not um, between the single shot and the, and the two dose regimens. Artistic responses to B117 in vaccinated individuals effective? Uh, sorry, can you repeat that one about B117? Yes. Artistic responses to B117 in vaccinated individuals effective? As far as we know, yes. Um, the good news about T cell responses is they seem to be much more durable than antibody responses. Um, what role they play in protecting against reinfection or disease, I think is, is too early to know. Uh, but certainly all of these uh, vaccines induce uh, strong T cell responses. Um, from the, the clinical trials, of course, we only know how, uh, how they respond for a few months, but based on uh, studies done on naturally infected people, including way back in 2002 with the original SARS coronavirus, those T cell responses seem to be quite, quite durable. And uh, they probably at least help a little bit in, in uh, protecting against reinfection or disease. Your data affirm that plug assay and the PCR can be discordant. One simple explanation is higher tendency to viral aggregation with some variant. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, plaque assays always leave open that possibility that you're underestimating the infectious titer. Um, 
On the other hand, we do, do know a lot based on human data that um, following human infection, there's a lot of shedding of, of something containing viral RNA into the nasal cavities that is no longer infectious, uh, typically about a week after the onset of, of illness or infection. There are people who shed viral RNA for, for months after infection with no evidence that any of that is infectious. So, so I think that um, there, there are advantages and disadvantages of using the genetically based versus the infection based uh, assays. I think what we've tried to do is combine both of them. For example, with that work on the 614 mutation, if we had only done these competition assays, we would assume that that 614 mutation had only a slight impact on upper respiratory tract replication and transmission because um, of that difference in the specific infectivity um, that, that adds on top to the differences you see with RNA levels. And, and you underestimate it if you only do RNA-based assays. So I think it's important to do both, at least in some of your experiments to make sure there's not a major difference that could really confound all these kinds of studies. I have time for about one more question, then I'll have to go. Yeah, sure. So this is the last question. Could you comment on whether or not the variant also escape detection by T cell? whether there's escape from T cell derived immunity. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not aware that anybody has shown this experimentally or even in human samples. Um, I'm sure that a lot of people are sequencing um, and looking for chain mutations within T cell epitopes. And I, I really can't say whether anybody has found any changes in any of the predicted T cell epitopes, but I haven't seen anything to raise concern about resistance to T cell immunity in, in any of these variants yet. But I suspect the T cell work is gonna lag behind the antibody-based work by quite some time. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Shinhei. Thank you so much, Scott, for great lectures. And uh, thank you to the attendees for many very interesting questions. This series of webinars is very important, obviously, and you can find the uh, advertisements and announcements on our website and in the GVN newsletters. So thank you to everybody, and thank you again, Scott. That was a great, great presentation. Thank you, Christian, and Shinhee and Kevin for setting this up. Thank you.